Hello, my fellow forgiven sinners. Grace and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. What would you say is the problem with the world? A lot of people have different thoughts on that. Uh, we uh, fill our our politics, uh, even our, our culture and our art, uh, music, all these kinds of things, our movies, uh, with, with the same question, right? What is wrong with the world? And uh, then what is the solution? What do we need to do to fix all of these problems? Uh, again, this is a very important question to all of us. Um, and actually, it's a very valuable uh, way to start uh, start a spiritual conversation with pretty much just about anybody, right? Uh, so what exactly is wrong with the world and what then is the solution? Uh, well, there's an interesting guy named G.K. Chesterton. When he was asked this question, he said, Dear Sir, I am. <laughs> uh, he recognized as a Christian that sin. Uh, yours and mine is the problem in the world. And so the answer is exactly what Jesus preached 2,000 years ago in Israel uh, during his ministry, repent and believe the good news. Uh, this is what God is calling out to the world uh, that we might have the answer uh, to this world's problem. Um, now, there's a question, though, that we have to uh, dig into. What exactly did Jesus mean when he said, repent and believe the good news? Uh, they're fairly simple words on the surface, but uh, it's very easy for us to mistake these things. It's very easy for us to run in various directions uh, not properly understanding them. Uh, and so today uh, we want to begin a study uh, based on the small called articles. These are uh, part of the Lutheran confessions, the definition of what it means to be a Lutheran. Um, and they are uh, they're, uh, accurate descriptions of what the Bible teaches. Uh, concerning what, what Christianity is. Uh, and that's why we hold to them um, as part of our confessions. So today we're looking at, uh, again, some specific parts uh, that uh, directly look at um, sin, the purpose of the law, and repentance, uh, really examining what are these things. Uh, now, the small called articles are specifically speaking against Roman Catholicism, but uh, in my context, I don't have many members that are uh, leaning that way at all. So uh, really, instead, I want to more apply it to more general culture uh, where we are pulled. And a lot of the teachings from 500 years ago that were written against in the small called articles are actually very still, uh, very much common still today. And so we want to take a look at these things. As I said, the first thing that we want to look at today is sin. Right? What exactly is the problem of sin? This is what the Bible says is the problem in the world. Uh, but today we want to understand what exactly is uh, or just how serious is the problem of sin. Now, most people have this idea that, yes, I do some bad things, right? I'm, I'm not perfect, right? Uh, everybody will recognize that concept. Uh, but how serious is the problem of my imperfection? How serious uh, is the problem of my own sin? In general, most people have the idea that our sin uh, the, is just the bad things we do, right? People think in those terms that it's just the bad things I do and therefore I can just stop doing those things. We focus on what's called actual sins, uh, the things that I actually do that I know are wrong, right? And if I just stop doing those uh, and start doing better things, then I will have dealt properly with my sin. This is kind of the natural way that most people are going to think about it, especially in our day and age. Um, we, we, we like to picture our sins similar to our health. Uh, so we think of our spiritual health uh, in a similar way to our uh, physical health, right? Uh, so with my physical health, right, if I have problems, um, there's a lot of stuff I can do, right? I can uh, improve my diet. I can improve my uh, uh, um, exercise routine. I can get a doctor. I can get medicine for various uh, health issues that I have. Uh, and the idea is that I can fix my health if I just make the proper decisions, if I just choose the right things, if I uh, just sincerely work at uh, what I need to, uh, then I will achieve health. Uh, and this is, again, the idea that many people have regarding their sin, uh, that if they just make all the right choices, if they just choose the right uh, spiritual foods, so to speak, right, uh, I will be able to fix my problem of sin. Uh, however, the question we want to ask today is, is that the way the Bible talks? Is that how the Bible describes the problem of our sin? Uh, I want to throw a couple of Bible passages at you here. Ephesians chapter 2 says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Right? This is how uh, we were, the Apostle Paul says, uh, that what we were instead raised to life. I again jump down to verse 4, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. 
So notice what he's saying here, that we were dead. It's not that we were just unhealthy and needed to make better choices, but we were dead and God had to miraculously bring us to life. Similar concepts going on in Colossians chapter 2. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins. Now notice here, um, the, the picture that we're getting from the Bible is not that you can fix yourself just by eating healthier or getting a better exercise regimen. Um, dead people can't eat better. Dead people can't exercise better, right? Uh, instead, dead people need a resurrection. They need a miracle from God if they are going to fix their problem. And this is how the Bible speaks about our sin, that it is a death. Uh, we are stuck, trapped in that in our sin. There, there's not a, a choice that we can make to fix that. There's not a way that we can uh, suddenly just come back to life. God has to work a miracle. Um, and th again, this is a, an important thing for us to understand because we live in a time when most people have the idea that we are basically good. And what they mean by that uh, is that we are basically good in the sense of most people can make the right decisions. Uh, one of my members said, yeah, of course we're basically good because um, we... Uh, um, I mean, we're not all just killing each other, right? Uh, but again, think about think about that question in these terms, right? Say, uh, say you and I are taking a test at school, right? Um, and uh, both of us utterly fail the test, right? F's across the board. Uh, but you say, no, actually, we should have passed because we weren't just ripping up the pages, right? Uh, again, okay, there, there's a one one step better than another, perhaps, right? Uh, but either way, we still failed the test. Uh, similarly, with morality. Just because we aren't, uh, just because we can pursue, perceive a worse uh, moral situation, doesn't mean that we have a passing grade, right? And so this is what we want to think about as we look at how the Bible describes the problem of our sin. Uh, now, this is not a popular teaching of the Bible. Uh, it's an insult to to us because we like to think that we are good people. We like to uh, puff ourselves up in our pride, um, and it's 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 uh, an offensive teaching from the Bible. But it is absolutely how the Bible talks. And so we want to understand what does the Bible say concerning our problem of sin? How serious is it? Uh, what is the issue? Uh, so first, I want to take you to Genesis chapter 6. Look at verse 5. This is just before God destroys the world in the flood. Um, but here we have this description of uh, the evil of humanity. It says, The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. Uh, the inclination of our hearts, right? If a, if a table is raised up on one side, right? The incline is going to make everything on top of that table go off in this direction every single time, right? Not nine times out of 10, 100% of the time, right? Uh, this is how the Bible describes human uh, sin. Um, another passage for us to consider is Romans 3. Uh, the Apostle Paul really goes hard on the wickedness of uh, humanity. Uh, and he's actually grabbing from a lot of different uh, verses from the Old Testament, especially the Psalms. Uh, but he says, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open at graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. And the way of peace they do not know there is no fear of God before their eyes. Uh, again, the Apostle Paul is making it very clear when God looks at the world, when God is uh, judging humanity, morally, uh, we are all falling short. Not a single one of us gets a passing grade. Uh, again, this is offensive to us, though. We don't like that idea. We like to look at the world and say, well, I'm not uh, murdering people, right? I'm not a drug dealer or whatever it is. We like to say, uh, there's somebody that's worse than me, therefore I must be good. Uh, but the question we have to ask is, where exactly is that bar for what it means to be good, right? Uh, generally, we like to set that bar for uh, the passing grade at just below how good I am, right? <laughs> that way I can look down on other people, uh, but I can easily dismiss my own faults, my own sins, right? So I can say, yeah, I know I'm not perfect, but I'm pretty good. Uh, but this is not how the Bible talks. The Bible says that if we want to uh, judge for how good we ought to be, uh, we are to compare ourselves to God. Um, in fact, that's another good verse for us to look at. Um, 
if you want to, or the, the Bible uh, tells us that we are to be perfect as our heavenly father is perfect. Matthew chapter five, uh, verse 48, uh, Matt, or Jesus is talking about, or this is his uh, sermon on the Mount. Uh, but he says uh, in verse 48, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly father is perfect, right? That's the standard that we are being held to. Uh, it's not that uh, God just arbitrarily chooses one person, uh, and if we're all better than him, then uh, then we're good people. Uh, no, the standard is God himself. And by that standard, all of us fall short, so very far short. Uh, and so if we are going to do anything good, uh, we need to be transformed. Again, we need this resurrection. Um, here's another uh, good passage for us to consider as we think about this. Uh, here it says, the mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. Uh, so this, this, mind, this fleshly mind that we start with, the mind governed by the flesh, the sinful nature in which we are born, uh, it is an enemy of God. Uh, going all the way back to the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve sinned, they joined Satan's side against God, right? Uh, that's, that's that realm of the flesh in which we live. Uh, it is naturally hostile to God. It is an enemy of God. God. It hates God. Um, Paul says it, do, it does not submit to God's law, so we don't even want to submit to God's law. Uh, but even if we did want to submit to God's law, we can't do it. Uh, it's impossible for us. Uh, so again, this is where we want to understand just how serious the problem of our sin is. In the small called articles, Luther uh, goes to um, the, the Roman Catholic teachings. Uh, and But again, like I said, uh, these are very much kind of the popular theology of our day as well. Uh, not necessarily just Roman Catholicism's official doc doctrines, uh, but it says um, that they teach that people have a free will to do good or evil, that we can obey all of God's commands by our natural human powers. So just by my own efforts, I can obey everything God says to do. Um, it says that uh, they teach that uh, God gives us grace if we only do as much as is in us. Uh, furthermore, they teach that the Holy Spirit is totally unnecessary for us to do good works. We don't need God's help at all for us to do what is right, for us to do what is good, what is pleasing in God's sight. Uh, once again, these are very common teachings throughout our world today, uh, across the board. Uh, again, uh, uh, many of my uh, members, as I was going through this, they kind of struggled <laughs> with these things. But as we look to the scriptures, uh, the description of our sin is that it, we are totally depraved. Uh, we are totally lost in our sins. Uh, and in fact, uh, we're, we're born in this way. Um, David describes himself in Psalm 51, 5. He says, surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Uh, this is David's confession psalm uh, where he is confessing his sin with Bathsheba uh, and his sin against Uriah. Um, and here, here again, notice he's not saying, yeah, one time I slipped up. Right? He's not saying, uh, here, I just did a real, I made a really bad choice in this one instance, but otherwise I'm a pretty good person. Uh, no, he's confessing, I am totally sinful, right? Uh, top to bottom, 100% of who I am, uh, it's all sin. Uh, and it started even from the very first possible point of my existence, uh, when I was conceived in my mother's womb, he says. That's when I started being sinful, right? Uh, and so this is, again, what, what the Bible continuously gives to us as far as when our sinful, where our sinfulness comes from, uh, that it's not just, just the bad things I do, uh, but it is who I am by my nature. Uh, and if you're a part of a Lutheran uh, congregation, you'll notice, uh, or a, at least a confessional Lutheran congregation, typically the confession of sins in our worship service uh, will, will say that. Uh, when we confess our sins, we confess that we are by nature sinful. We don't just confess, sometimes I do stuff I shouldn't. Uh, instead, we are by nature sinful, uh, thoroughly lost in our sins. And as we confess that we are thoroughly lost in our sins, uh, we are also uh, putting our hope in Christ uh, as a full savior for all of it, not just some of the things I do, but for everything uh, that I am. Um, now, again, we want to kind of dig into this a little bit more and get a little more clear on how the Bible talks about these things. So um, as uh, we look at uh, the small called articles, part three, article one, Luther first off talks about uh, the, the number one thing we need to realize with our sin. Uh, and that's the doctrine of original sin. Uh, Luther even calls this the chief sin. Um, and so let's look at Romans chapter 5, 12. There it says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all people because all sinned. Um, we have sort of a beginning of a sentence, not a full sentence there. Uh, but notice what he's saying. Um, right there from the sin of Adam, that's when we all became subject to both sin and death. Right? Uh, this is that original sin, 
uh, that starts in us right from that time when Adam sinned. All of us participated in that sin as well. We are we have this corrupt nature now uh, that is who we are uh, because of our wickedness. Uh, and so this is really the chief sin. This is the most important of sins. Um, now, this is interesting, again, because we often, like I said, we, we like to think that sins are just the bad things I do. We, we talk about actual sins. I put in quotation marks. Uh, actual sins as the bad things that I know I do. And we can all point to and say, yep, that, that right there, that action right there was bad. Uh, I can do better. Um, but, but where do those actual sins come from? This is the question. Um, actual sins are not the sin itself, but instead they are fruits of this original sin. They are what grows from us because of our original sin. So here's, here's a good example of that. In Matthew chapter 15, uh, the, uh, or Jesus rather, uh, Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees and they're upset that the disciples are uh, eating in an unclean way. Um, and Jesus says, uh, well, hold on. In verse uh, 19 here, Jesus says, for out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person but eating with unwashed hands does not defile them. Uh, notice what he says, right? Uh, all of these things come out of a evil heart, right? Uh, and, and because we do these things that are wrong, uh, these fruits of our sin uh, are evidence that we are uh, corrupt on the inside. Uh, another picture that the Bible uses is uh, the, the fruit and the tree, right? Uh, a bad tree is going to produce bad fruit, right? Uh, so if the tree is corrupt, uh, it's going to continue to produce uh, corrupt fruits, right? Uh, the problem is not that I need to fix the fruits. The problem is that I need to fix the tree, right? That's the idea that we're getting from the scriptures here. Uh, now, Luther, uh, again, playing off of what Jesus is saying here, looking back to what Jesus is saying here, uh, Luther explains that... Um, these actual sins are not the problems. Uh, instead, uh, we need to find a solution, not just for the fruits, but for the whole tree itself. And this is why the gospel is so absolutely valuable, uh, because we realize we are thoroughly lost in our sins. We are dead in our sins. And the gospel is God's power to raise us to spiritual life. Um, so Luther digs into some fascinating sins here. Um, and it's, it's really helpful for us to dig into these things. Um, typically, when we talk about sins again, uh, when we're commonly thinking about sins, we're, we're thinking about the, the, the various crimes and vices that everybody can point to, right? Again, you can even uh, go to somebody in prison, right? And, and somebody that has committed horrible atrocities against their fellow man, uh, and they will talk about how evil it is to cheat on somebody, right? They will talk about how you should never betray somebody that, that is trusting you, right? Uh, all of us recognize that certain things are, are absolutely evil. It doesn't necessarily stop us from doing it, but we can recognize certain actions as being absolutely depraved, absolutely wrong. Um, however, uh, just because I can point over to that guy over there and say, hey, what that guy did is wrong, that doesn't make me clean. That doesn't make me right with God. I still have this same sin in my own heart. And this, think of what Jesus teaches in uh, his Sermon on the Mount, right? Uh, where Jesus points out, um, uh, points out to the various uh, kinds of sins and how a smaller portion uh, is actually just as important. Uh, so Jesus, uh, for example, Matthew chapter 5, 21, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. And anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka is answerable to the court. And anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fire of hell. Similarly, jump down to uh, adultery here. Verse 27, you have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Uh, now notice what he's saying here, right? We can all point to, okay, murder, bad, right? Cheating on your spouse, bad. We can recognize those evil actions. But Jesus says we have to be careful also of that inner sin, that smaller uh, impetus that leads me to that greater sin. Right? So when I hate my neighbor, that is the exact same source that uh, grows into murder given time. Right? When I lustfully look at a, some, at a person who is not my spouse, right? uh, this also uh, is the exact same impetus that grows into adultery. Right? Uh, these kinds of things. Uh, and so Jesus, again, is pointing out that corruption of sin uh, in its smaller ways so that we can better understand it. Um, now, I want to walk through a, a list of sins that uh, Martin Luther uh, lays out in uh, this section of the Small Called Articles. 
Um, and I want to walk through it just because it's valuable for us to think about what exactly is sin. Um, now, notice uh, the way he describes, especially the first and second commandments, uh, and, and his, his greater explanation of those commandments is really valuable for us because we tend to just kind of ignore the first and second commandments. Um, so he says, um, well, let me see if I can fix this. Maybe we'll see if that comes through well. Uh, so Luther gives us a list of uh, sins here. Uh, so he says, unbelief. Uh, he's talking about, again, these evils of the heart, these fruits uh, that show themselves, that show that we are corrupt from within. Uh, he says, unbelief, uh, false faith, idolatry, being without fear of God, pride, despair, utter blindness, and in short, not knowing or regarding God. Also lying, abusing God's name, not praying, not calling on God, not regarding God's word, being disobedient to parents, murdering, being unchaste, stealing, deceiving, and such. Now, what do you notice? Uh, think about the, that list of sins here uh, as we think about the Ten Commandments. Uh, you'll notice uh, the first ones here, unbelief, false faith, idolatry, being without uh, the fear of God, pride, despair, utter blindness, and in short, not knowing or regarding God. That's all the first commandment, right? Uh, all of those are sins of the first commandment, uh, where we are uh, having other gods before the one true God. Similarly, uh, here, lying, abusing God's name, not praying, not calling on God. That's all the second commandment. Very interesting there. Uh, these are all ways that we misuse God's name. Don't use it in the right way that God wants us to. Uh, not regarding God's word. That's the third commandment. D being disobedient to parents. Murdering being unchaste, stealing, deceiving. Again, he only gives us one uh, word uh, or just very simple words, very simple descriptions of the other commandments, right? Uh, but he gets, spends a bit more time on those first ones. And it's interesting because very often, um, it's especially in our, our modern culture uh, and especially in groups that really want to uh, try to be saved by them being good enough, uh, by that fixation on actual sins, typically we will just kind of ignore the sins against the first or second commandment. Right? Maybe we'll maybe we'll be upset with people that uh, you know say Jesus Christ when they stub their toe or something, right? Uh, but generally, we kind of ignore uh, these other kind of sins against God. Um, for example, um, unbelief. Right? Do we even consider that a sin? Right? Uh, in, in some cases, people are proud of that. <laughs> uh, in some cases, people uh, consider it a virtue uh, to um, to not believe. Uh, at, at, at best, though, we we would simply look at unbelief as some as being an innocent thing. Right? Well, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just they don't know any better, right? Uh, but again, think about, uh, as, as you think about sin as a, or these actual sins as a uh, fruit of our corrupt nature, uh, again, these are the most serious, the most clearest uh, evidences of our sins on the inside, of our sinfulness, I should say, of that corrupt tree reality, right? Uh, if God made us to, to be with him, to be his people uh, very uh, clearly, then uh, unbelief is a, clear showing that I am no longer uh, perfectly united with God. I am no longer perfectly uh, connected with him, right? Uh, and in fact, this is very much what Jesus came to restore is faith in God, right? Uh, when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, uh, they, they broke that relationship that they had with God. Uh, they no longer looked at him as being good. They no longer looked at him as being trustworthy. They uh, felt they needed to hide from him. They felt they were against him, right? Uh, even though God had given no uh, evidence at all that he was against them, uh, they nevertheless tried to hide from God. Um, and so in a similar way, uh, God then is restoring our relationship to himself through the gospel, through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. When we see just how much God loves us, just how much Jesus was willing to do for our tremendous fault, for our tremendous sin, right? Uh, this now restores that relationship to God. Um, so I want to walk through, uh, especially the sins or the descriptions of the first commandment uh, that we have in the small called articles here, um, because I think this is valuable. Uh, and just because we, we do tend to undermine these kinds of sin, we kind of think of them as, as not being a big deal. Um, I have a note here, uh, again, just interesting to chew on. Uh, when people say don't judge today, they typically aren't talking about murderers or racists, right? Uh, there are certain sins that are just beyond the pale and we are totally fine judging those. Uh, generally, we use that slogan to dismiss uh, sins against God or sexual sins, right? Kind of interesting there. Uh, why, why do we make those arbitrary judgments on when we can judge or when we cannot judge, right? Uh, clearly, there's something wrong with our view of judging or not judging. Right uh, here again is where it's much better to to have a biblical understanding of what Jesus is saying when he says don't judge. Um, but let's take a look at these sins and, and how they do very clearly reveal our uh, sinfulness. 
how they very clearly reveal that we are corrupt trees producing corrupt fruit. Even if you're a stellar uh, uh, member of society, right? Even if you're a virtuous person, people look up to you, people respect you. Um, even in that case, you still fall short of the glory of God, right? Uh, as uh, as uh, Paul said earlier, right? There is no one who does good. And these, these uh, sins are evidences of that. Um, so first off, unbelief, we already spoke about that. Uh, false faith and idolatry go together. Uh, Luther's ex in Luther's explanation of the first commandment, he says we should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. Uh, and so in false faith, uh, I am doing exactly that. I am fearing, loving, and trusting something other than God, other than what God has said. Uh, in idolatry, similar thing, right? I am fearing, loving, or trusting something other than God. Uh, the distinction here in these uh, phrases, uh, false faith would be uh, when I trust in something that God has not actually said. Uh, so if I'm uh, led astray by false teaching, right, if I'm believing something that's not true, um, if I uh, uh, make God say something that he never did say, right? Um, so uh, many people will, um, for example, they'll pray to God when uh, maybe they need more money uh, in a situation or maybe they have a family member that's struggling or a relationship that's falling apart. And then uh, they'll pray, God, uh, put this back together, might fix this problem that I'm having. Uh, and then that earthly, worldly problem isn't, doesn't just go away. Uh, and they think uh, that, well, God uh, didn't hold up his side of the bargain, right? Um, now, again, is is God actually not holding up his side of the bargain? Or as he promised us in his word, in this world, you will have troubles. But fear not, I have overcome the world, right? Uh, there's there's a clear problem there. I'm holding God to a promise that he never made, right? And if I'm holding God to a promise he never made, then I have a false faith. I'm trusting in something God never said. Similar with uh, um, uh, superstitions. Right. If I'm if I'm trusting in something that that God never told me to trust in, right? Uh, if I'm trusting that my uh, dead family members are still speaking to me through uh, through ghost activity or something, or if I'm uh, trusting that I'm going to have bad luck because I uh, broke a mirror, or uh, that my baseball team is going to win if I don't wash my underwear, right? These kinds of silly things. Um, again, these are not things God has promised us. These are not things that God has told us to trust in to believe. That is false faith. Idolatry, similar thing. Uh, people worship all kinds of things today. Uh, if you go if you go through the Old Testament, especially, you'll see all kinds of idols uh, going on, uh, plaguing God's people. Uh, there's just as many, if not more, idols today. Uh, people today uh, very commonly worship money, science, pleasure, honor, power, all these kinds of things. Uh, there are idols that uh, seem seem to be good things, right? Like uh, friends and family, right? These are very good things, uh, and yet we can make idols of them when we fear, love, and trust them uh, more than God. Uh, we also make idols of bad things like substance abuse or, or these kinds of things. Again, things that we would all uh, look at and say, yeah, that's bad. We shouldn't be involved in that. Um, so even Christians then, yeah, are, are uh, tempted in this way to serve idols and to even use their worship of God in service of their idol, right? So an example is, right, if I'm, uh, if I'm being faithful to God merely so that I can have a nice earthly life, right? If I, if I am using my uh, devotion to God as a way to get money, or as a way to get uh, the other thing that I truly want, right? Uh, then I'm really using God as a tool to get what I really want, to serve my real God. Do you see how, how that idolatry can, can even infect a Christian, right? Uh, and this is very much that, that uh, problem that I just said, right? Uh, the, the person that says, well, God, you didn't give me the thing that I wanted, therefore I'm not going to trust in you anymore, right? They don't actually want God, do they? They aren't actually worshiping God, are they? They're not loving God above all things. They're loving this other thing. And they're saying, God, because you didn't, because I wasn't able to use you as a means to get what I truly want, I don't want you anymore, God. Right? Again, do you see the idolatry there? That's the problem. Um, the next, uh, the next sin um, that Luther mentions here uh, is being without fear, uh, true fear of God. Uh, this is interesting. Uh, in the German, uh, Luther uh, uses the word atheist here. Actually, uh, Psalms forty-one and fifty-three, uh, both of those psalms addressed the fool who says in his heart. There is no God. Uh, yet uh, when it focuses on this fool who says in his heart, there is no God, they're not talking about a person who is unconvinced that God exists. Though that, again, is pretty clear evidence that, again, they have a broken relationship with God if they don't believe he exists, right? Uh, just like unbelief. Uh, however, uh, when Psalms 14 and 53 talk about this fool who says in his heart, there is no God, uh, instead the focus is on those people who do evil, believing that they won't be punished for it, believing, believing that God will not respond to their wickedness, that God's just going to let them do that evil uh, and, and they can continue on in it. Uh, no, no problems. Uh, now, again, uh, this is very much a temptation for Christians, right? Um, in fact, this is a very common uh, story I've heard from, from many different people. Somebody that says that, well, I know that uh, 
what I'm going to do here is a sin, but God will forgive me, but I was baptized, but I'll just go to church tomorrow uh, or whatever it is, right? Um, again, if that's your mentality, you're not a real Christian, right? Uh, you, don't, you don't care what God says, actually, right? Uh, you have no true fear of God, right? Um, and so, yeah, if, if, if you, can, you can say, I believe in God, but if you do not care about how God wants you to live, right? Uh, that, that's, that's really an atheist right there, right? Even if, and maybe you do believe in God, but uh, if you're going to live contrary to what he says, if you're going to live in sin uh, and think, well, God's not going to do anything about it, I can just do whatever I want. Uh, again, you're really, biblically, from a biblical standpoint, you are really an atheist. Uh, once again, you see the value. We can we could rage against all the people out there that are doing all kinds of crazy sins and everything, um, but that doesn't actually help us spiritually. Uh, it helps us to understand these more minute sins, these more subtle manifestations, those more subtle uh, instances of sin that come into our own hearts, uh, like like Jesus does in his Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Luther further condemns pride uh, or presumption is another good translation there. Uh, in this case, we're trusting in ourselves, in one's own ability, in one's own merits, one's own worthiness, right? I'm puffing myself up. Uh, pride is a common sin uh, for uh, those who want to uh, live in self-righteousness, those who want to earn their salvation by what they do. Uh, this is very much a... Um, in, in line with the Roman Catholic uh, system of penance. We'll, we'll talk about that in, in, a, in the future study. Um, but especially uh, anybody that is seeking to earn their spot before God, uh, pride is the, is the basis of that entire thing, right? Uh, that they have to be number one. It's got to be all about them doing all the right things, right? Um, Luther also mentions despair. Uh, despair uh, is uh, um, something we fall into when we reject God's gospel promises or when we doubt his goodness. Right? So if I don't think God is good enough uh, to, to help me through my situation, if, God, if I uh, reject God's promise that he will be with me always, even to the very end of the age, right? Uh, if I reject these things, that leads me into despair. Now, once again, we typically uh, look at somebody in despair as, as a victim, right? As somebody uh, that's in a bad circumstance. And, and we can have that uh, sympathy for people. However, uh, this again is clear evidence that the person is rejecting God, that the person has that corrupt tree situation, right? Um, interesting enough, despair can also come in, a, in the form of a, a kind of negative pride. Uh, so uh, in, in pride, we just talked about, right, uh, I'm obsessing over my own uh, abilities, merits, or worthiness, right? Um, but with despair, uh, it's kind of the exact same thing. I'm still obsessing over myself, but I'm saying, oh, but I'm not good enough, right? Uh, so I'm still obsessing over my own ability, merits, and worthiness. But instead of saying, I'm so great, I'm saying, I'm so poor, I'm so bad, right? Uh, again, this is not what God's uh, word is to lead us to where you're constantly beating yourself up and saying, man, I'm so bad. I'm so horrible. I'm, I'm and this and I'm that. Uh, instead, uh, the purpose of God's law is to show us what our sin is, is, to recognize just how bad it is so that we can recognize just how great our salvation is in Jesus. Right. Um, the next uh, one that, that uh, uh, is mentioned here in this list is uh, blindness. We're talking spiritual blindness. Um, and this is not a, a partial blindness uh, that we just need some glasses and then we can see fine uh, the things of God. But instead, this is a total spiritual blindness that we cannot in any way understand what God is saying. Um, we, we cannot figure it out on our own. We need God to reveal these things for us. We are walking around in the dark. We need God to turn the light on if we are going to understand any of this. We'll dig into that in just a moment. <laughs> um, but notice again, with all of these things, uh, very commonly in our world, uh, Today, we, we belittle and ignore all of these sins. We don't really consider them that bad. Uh, pride, uh, again, we, we rage against it in others, but pride in ourselves, we kind of think that's okay, right? Otherwise, for the most part, we all kind of ignore these sins as being wrong, but they are all clear violations of that first commandment, uh, and they all clearly um, lead us away from God. They are all clear evidences uh, that we are not uh, in a good uh, relationship with God. They are that the, the tree is corrupt, uh, therefore the fruits are corrupt. Um, now, jumping ahead here, um, on the topic of blindness, we just mentioned that a moment ago. Uh, Luther explains this hereditary sin is such a deep corruption of nature that no reason can understand it. Rather, it must be believed from the revelation of Scripture. Um, now, this is something that's very difficult for us to, to grapple with. Um, again, we had that verse a moment ago, Romans chapter 8, verse 7 to 8. Uh, the mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. Okay. Uh, again, we like to think, well, that my reason is perfectly fine. Right? I can 
understand all these things. I can figure out what is true all by myself, right? Uh, in fact, that's one of our slogans today, right? Think for yourself, right? Uh, and if I just think for myself, then I'll be able to find all truth. Uh, however, have you ever lied to yourself? Um, I'm guessing you have. <laughs> um, it's, it's very easy for us uh, to lie to ourselves. In fact, uh, it's been said that the easiest person to lie to is yourself. Right. Uh, very often, uh, uh, one of the most difficult questions for us to grapple with is what do you do with people that disagree with you? What do you do with people that uh, see the same evidence as you, but they come to a completely different conclusion? Uh, generally, we like to think, well, there must be something wrong with their uh, reason, right? Mine's obviously working fine, but their reason must be terrible, right? Or they must be evil, or they must be stupid, uh, or they must not be able to, to see through the lies like I'm able to see through the lies, right? Um, but again, what, what is the basis for us to assume that? Right. Uh, in psychology, there's a very interesting concept of confirmation bias by which all of us naturally uh, kind of ignore evidence that contradicts what we want to believe. Uh, and we hyper fixate on evidence that we do want to believe. Right. Uh, so what is your answer to that? <laughs> How do you know that you're able to get by this confirmation bias? Uh, how do you get through that? Uh, and interestingly enough, education doesn't actually solve the problem of that. People that are higher, more higher educated uh, tend to fall into confirmation bias all the more uh, easily. And, and uh, they're able to kind of walk through and explain why uh, their confirmation bias is actually justified. So it's, it's very difficult, right? This is a horribly difficult thing in psychology. Uh, well, in spiritual matters, the problem is so much more. This is not just a psychological issue. This is a spiritual issue right? Uh, so spiritually, uh, to even grasp, to even come to the conclusion that my reason doesn't grasp the things of God well at all, uh, that's very difficult for us to think through. Uh, John chapter 3, 3, this is Jesus talking to Nicodemus. Uh, he says, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Uh, again, just as we said that our sin is a death and we need to be raised to life in order to, um, in order to, have this uh, problem of our sin solved, so too the, the corruption of our reason. Uh, I can't even see what God is doing. I can't even see the kingdom of God. I can't perceive it um, unless I'm born again. Once again, a, a dead person can't see anything. So in the same way, uh, I can't think the right things as a dead person until God raises me to life. I need the scriptures to come in and reveal these things for me to believe properly what is true, right? Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Uh, says, the person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. Uh, here the Apostle Paul is saying, again, you need the Holy Spirit if you're going to understand uh, the things of God. Uh, otherwise, you're just going to consider godly things to be foolish. Once again, how many people look at the Scriptures and they say, ah, oh, this is just nonsense. And they just dismiss it. They don't even give it a second thought. Right? This is our natural state. We hear the things of God, we think it's silliness, right? I'm going to ignore it. I don't need it um, because I think I've got it all figured out. I assume my reason is working just fine. But why should you assume your reason, reason is working just fine, right? Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3, it says, No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Uh, once again, um, Paul is not teaching here that uh, an atheist cannot say Jesus is Lord or an unbeliever can't say Jesus is Lord, just the mouthing of the syllables. Uh, but you can't actually believe this, right? Uh, you can't actually believe in Jesus except by the Holy Spirit. Once again, our sin, we are dead in our sins uh, and we need this resurrection. So faith, the Bible teaches, is itself a miracle. It is God uh, changing us uh, so that we do believe what God teaches, what God says, excuse me, uh, and that we do ultimately believe the gospel. Um, again, this is this is a difficult thing for us to wrestle with, um, but I think it's valuable for us to think through this, and it's absolutely necessary for us to do, to understand these things. Uh, the bigger we recognize our sin to be, the greater we can recognize our Savior to be. Um, this is just a uh, um, section uh, I, I wrote a, a paper on this uh, section before, um, but I thought there was some good stuff here to think through to chew on. Um, this is the problem of mankind's fall. As soon as man and woman ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, we now assume that we can find moral and spiritual truths for ourselves and that God must honor whatever our findings be. Okay, notice uh, right, right from the get-go, we assume that we can perceive, we can figure out spiritual reality without God's help, right? We don't need him. Uh, and anything I happen to find, we also assume that God has to respect and honor whatever I find, right? Uh, again, notice these assumptions don't add up. They don't actually make sense, but we so, it's, we so readily believe these things. Uh, furthermore, uh, going on here, uh, we refuse to live by grace, 
but instead want to earn God's love and favor as a reward for our perceived good at deeds. Okay. Uh, so again, God comes to us and says, Hey, I, I've saved you from your sins by dying on the cross and I give you the free gift of salvation. Uh, and we take that gift and we throw it back in God's face and say, no, I'm going to earn it. I'm going to earn my salvation. Um, but rather than listening to God's word that says, okay, if you want to earn your salvation, you have to be perfect like your father in heaven is perfect. We just looked at those words, right? Uh, we instead say, no, I'm going to define my own goodness. And then God, you have to accept that. Right? Notice, notice how we're demanding that God meet us on our terms rather than us meeting God on his terms. Right? Notice again, the pride that we talked about before. I'm assuming that I get to call the shots with God. I'm assuming that I'm in charge here. Right? Um, furthermore here, we obey God's commands, not out of love for him, but so that we might put God into our debt as though he now owes us blessings, uh, owes us his blessings, okay? Again, this is that natural, self-righteous way of looking at uh, spiritual things, right? Uh, I'm, okay, God, I'm going to serve you. I'm going to do what you want, uh, but it's not because I love you, right? It's because I just want your stuff, right? This is what the, uh, the, the self-righteous person does. Um, they demand God's blessings, right? God, send me to the good place, send me to heaven, uh, and in return, I will buy that off of you by how I live. But notice again, the motive is ultimately selfish, right? God, I'm not uh, living the ways you want because I love you, right? I'm living the ways you want because I want to extract things from you. I want to get things from you, right? And if you're not going to give me my stuff, then I'm out of here. Again, this mentality is, is an insult to God. God has already saved us by grace, by his undeserved love for us. It's a slap in God's face to instead insist on our own self-righteousness. And our own self-righteousness falls so far short of what God demands. Um, we reject God's mercy as an insult on our dignity, right? Again, there's that pride again. Uh, then we choose our own personal morality rather than following God's. Okay, so instead of uh, going to the scriptures and figuring out, okay, how does God want me to live? And that's how I'm going to live. Instead, we just choose our own, right? Uh, I think this is wrong. I think this is okay. This is not so bad, right? Uh, these sins that that guy over there is committing, those are really bad. But my sins, yeah, they're, they're, they're okay, right? Um, that's, that's generally how we do morality today, right? Uh, then we fall short of what we, do, we uh, say is right and wrong. Uh, and when we fall short of what we say uh, we should do, well, then we say, well, hey, nobody's perfect, right? I did my best. And God, you had better accept uh, my best, <laughs> right? Uh, again, uh, people say that all the time, right? Just do your best. But what exactly is your best? How do you know when you've actually achieved your best? Right? Uh, how do you know when you've just totally fallen flat on your face? Right? Again, it's, we, we leave it very vague, very, very ambiguous. And yet we still uh, demand, okay, but I, I did my best, God, so you have to accept whatever happened. No, I didn't live up to the standard I wanted to. Um, no, I didn't live up to your standards, but God, you have to accept me as a good person now. Right? Uh, again, this is, this is kind of nonsense. <laughs> spiritually, when you, when you think through self-righteousness, uh, these things do not add up. These things don't work. These things don't make sense. Um, final section we want to go through here today is just thinking about the purpose of God's law. Um, this is uh, part three, article two, uh, and it speaks about the purpose of God's law. Luther uh, first points out that the law was given to restrain sin by threats and the dread of punishment and by the promise and offer of grace and benefit. Uh, again, this is the natural way that we think about law, about rules, right? This is naturally how it works in the world around us, right? Uh, that uh, we make laws and rules uh, and we say, yeah, if you break these rules, bad stuff's going to happen. If you obey these rules, good stuff is going to happen. And so we think, well, that must be how it's going to work with God too, right? Um, but the problem is our sinful nature. And because of our sinful nature, because the tree is corrupt, the fruits are going to be corrupt as well. And so even this first purpose of the law just fails. It doesn't work, okay? Um, the law makes us worse sinners. And it does so in two ways. There are generally two uh, ways this happens. Uh, in the first group of people, uh, sometimes the, the both of these groups of people can be in one person, right? Sometimes you and I can fall into both of these things at the same time. Um, but in general, uh, either we hate God's law because it forbids the things that we want to do. Um, and so uh, we still want to keep doing it, even though it's we're, we're told it's wrong, right? And so if we can escape punishment, we break the law as much as we possibly can, uh, and even more so because we know it's against the law. That first group of people uh, Luther calls the unrestrained and wicked who do evil whenever they have opportunity, right? So this is, again, that, that uh, childish thing, right, uh, where uh, mom says, I can't have any cookies, and 
what do I want more than anything? Boy, I want one of those cookies, <laughs> right? Uh, again, this is that, that natural thing that happens in people. We hear what is wrong, what we ought not to do, but we want to do it all the more. And so in some cases, this is what the law works in our hearts because of our sinful nature. We hear this is wrong and we think that's exactly what I want to do. Um, on the other side, the other way that we break the law uh, is that we become blind and arrogant because of the law. We assume that we are good enough to obey the law by our own abilities. And so Luther calls these the hypocrites and the false saints. Take a look at this section from Romans chapter uh, chapters 1 and 2. The Apostle Paul gives us these exact categories. Uh, he doesn't name them exactly those categories, but these, these two types of uh, re responses in sin. Uh, in Romans chapter 1, the Apostle Paul has a very long tirade against uh, just the wickedness in the world and just how much evil you see. Here uh, again, Romans chapter 1 verse tw uh, 29. He says, they have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. Uh, so once again, right? Uh, this first group, all right, the unrestrained and the wicked, right? Uh, they, they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, uh, but they not only continue to do those things, uh, but they approve of those who practice them, right? Uh, so this is that first category, right? Uh, so the law comes into my life, tells me, hey, what you're doing is wrong, and that's all I want to do now, right? I want to do it all the more, right? The unrestrained and the wicked. Uh, and then we have this second category, the false saints and the hypocrites. Uh, and this is, again, following immediately after what we just read. This is from chapter 2. You, therefore, the Apostle Paul writes, you, therefore, have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else. For at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself, because you who pass judgment do the same things. Now, we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. So when you, a mere human being, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? Uh, notice what Paul is saying here, right? Uh, this is that hypocrites and uh, and false saints, right? Uh, so again, you've got the unrestrained and the wicked. And as you and I sit here looking at those ter terrible people and say, yeah, they're so bad, I'm, I'm way better. Uh, Paul says, well, hold on, you do the same things. Again, go back to what we read from Jesus uh, in his Sermon on the Mount, right? Uh, yeah, murderers are bad, uh, but that hatred in your heart, that's, that's damnable too, right? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, cheating on your spouse is bad, uh, but your lust, as you look at uh, somebody that's not your spouse, right? Uh, that's also danger endangering you uh, with the fires of hell, right? And so this is what Paul is saying. Uh, so as I'm sitting here judging that other person and saying, yeah, they're so horrible. They're looking at how evil they are. Uh, I'm also pointing the finger at myself because I also break the exact same commandments, right? Maybe not in that same overt way, uh, but that same sinful impetus is in me, right? I'm still just as corrupt a tree as that person. Maybe my fruits are a little less corrupt, <laughs> uh, but it doesn't change the fact that I'm a bad tree, right? Um, so Luther kind of gives a fascinating example of uh, how the how the law then affects us. Um, and uh, I'm going to walk you through some passages from Romans where the Apostle Paul gives us the very same concepts. Um, because of our sinful nature, uh, the law could, no, could not serve its original purpose as we merely gain God's wrath from the law and sink deeper into sin. For this reason, the Bible teaches that the law's chief purpose is to serve as a mirror, revealing mankind's total corruption because of sin. The law reveals how evil we are. Uh, we like to think of the law as a ladder that if I uh, can climb it, that I can get up to heaven. Uh, but instead, the law is a mirror that shows us just how sinful we are. Uh, again, Small Called Articles, Luther writes, the law must tell us that we have no God, that we do not care for God, and that we worship other gods, something we would not have believed before and without the law. In this way, we become terrified, humbled, depressed. We despair and anxiously want help, but see no escape. We begin to be an enemy of God and to complain and so on. Uh, so take a look at what, what uh, the Apostle Paul writes in Romans. Uh, Romans 8, it says, For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh. We'll come back to finish that sentence in a moment. Uh, but Paul says, yeah, the law was powerless to make you and me righteous, to make us right in God's sight, to make us perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect. It was unable to do that because of our sinfulness, because of our sinful flesh, right? Uh, that sinful nature we have. Uh, instead of uh, making us righteous, the law instead made us either 
unrestrained and wicked or false saints, right? And so instead of becoming more righteous, we became more wicked. Uh, in Romans chapter 3.20, it says, Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. So once again, uh, the law is not serving uh, to help me climb up to God by my obedience to the law, right? It's not that ladder that I can get up to heaven with. Uh, instead, uh, it makes me aware, conscious, awake to my own sinfulness. Uh, the uh, Apostle Paul goes on in Romans 7 verses 21 to 24. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner to the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? So notice how Paul talks about his own struggle with his own sinful nature. And again, Paul's a good guy by worldly standards. Uh, again, many Christians are going to look at the Apostle Paul and say, yeah, that's somebody I want to be like, right? <laughs> he does a lot of good. Um, and yet Paul, as he is thinking about his own struggle with sin, he says, I am totally lost, right? Uh, in my inner being, he says, I delight in God's law, right? I, I think that what God says is good is good, right? I want to live that way. And yet I can't carry it out because of my sinful nature. I am constantly living against God's law. And so Paul actually despairs, just like Luther talked about, right? We, we despair, we become terrified, we become humbled, we become depressed. Paul says, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death, right? Uh, Paul recognized just what a hopeless state he is in. Uh, continuing on, uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 10, it says, for if we were uh, God's enemies, right? That's what we were. Uh, we joined Satan's side against God, just like Adam and Eve did by eating from the fruit. They joined the side of Satan and made themselves enemies of God. Uh, going over there, uh, Romans chapter 4, verse 15 says, because the law brings wrath, right? Again, the law doesn't make us righteous. Instead, the law brings wrath. It makes us, uh, it makes us objects of God's anger, his righteous anger over sin. Right? Because the law shows just how sinful we are, and the law even makes us more sinful. Uh, and that's what Romans uh, 5.20 says. The law was brought in so that the trespass might increase. Uh, this is what Luther meant when he said that uh, the law makes us worse sinners. Uh, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more. Okay, so notice what we're seeing here. Right, The law is not a remedy to our sinful state. The law is not a health regimen to get you into good spiritual health. Uh, instead, the law makes our sinful state worse. It kills us. But in this way, God prepares us for that heavenly healing of the gospel. Uh, I'm going to go back to some of those passages that I skipped over a, uh, a bit before. Uh, again, Romans chapter 8, verse 3. Uh, for what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the sinful flesh. Again, make us righteous. The law couldn't do it. But God did that. God made us righteous by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh, right? Jesus took that punishment that our sins deserved. Sin was condemned. Sin was punished, right? But in Jesus rather than in you and me, right? This is the salvation that, that Jesus has won for us. You and I couldn't do it. We were so hopelessly lost, but Jesus has brought us this amazing salvation. Uh, jumping down to Romans 5.10, for if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life, right? Uh, if we were, uh, when we were God's enemies, Jesus died for us at that point, right? How much greater blessing is ours now that we have been brought to this new spiritual life through faith in Jesus? That's what Paul's getting at, right? Uh, again, Romans chapter 20, or, sorry, sorry, chapter 5, verse 20, the law was brought in so that the trespass might increase, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more. Uh, Jesus taught, uh, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Right. Uh, if you believe that you are a basically good person, then you will see no reason for Jesus. Right. And that's, in fact, why the uh, Pharisees and the teachers of the law hated Jesus and killed him because they believed themselves to be good people. And then Jesus came in and told them, no, you're actually not. <laughs> the people that most hate Jesus are the people who think they are good. Uh, the people who think they don't need Jesus. Uh, but if you do recognize your sin, if you see just how lost you are uh, in your sinful nature, uh, then Jesus is the exact Savior that you need. The greater your sin uh, uh, becomes, the greater your Savior will be as well. 
Uh, so the purpose of all this is ultimately that we do recognize what an amazing salvation we have in Jesus Christ, how awesome the gospel truly is. Next time we will dig into what repentance is, uh, what it actually means given uh, the um, reality of our sin, that it's not just a couple bad things I do, but it is uh, the, the entirety of my sinful nature. Uh, and so what what is repentance and faith in the good news? Uh, we'll get dig into that next time. With that, God's richest blessings on you. Until we meet again, feel free to share any uh, questions or comments you have, uh, but we'll see you next time.